will be presented by Dr. John Robbins and Kimochi Swiss from Exxon Concord Eastern Science Days. Right. Thank you, Bill Morris. Crystal white 
silica is nearly always covered by cyanoxic <coughs> bridges or silica hydroxyl bonds. We next compare, we next go from the environment of CO10 absorption at room temperature into <coughs> uh, hydrogenation of the temperature program and pulse CO reduction regimes. Here we're following the reduction of a monolayer of CO and hydrogen, either in the program mode or isothermally at 200 degrees C. We're looking at this by infrared. Finally, let's look at the real catalysts. We can look at all three systems at steady state during CO hydrogenation. Now, I'll tell you what we're, I'm going to tell you. In fact, several of these catalysts do show low frequency CO stretching modes when CO is going to absorb at room temperature. I'm not sure what they are. From our reactivity studies and ramped uh, and hydrogen, it's not clear that these structures are any more reactive than normal platinum CO. Some of them, in fact, are the most inert structures on the surface. What I will tell you is that when we look at these materials at steady state CO hydrogenation, we do see evidence for some reactive intermediates that are consistent with our concept that there is chemistry going on at the interface, albeit differently than the one shown by the model light presented earlier. Briefly, all the materials we're talking about are high load, highly loaded platinum, eight weight percent, but poorly dispersed systems. We have had we've had to use poorly dispersed systems for two reasons. Number one, we wanted to eliminate possible metal particle size effects. Number two, if you want to look in a low in a, in a low frequency region of a higher spectrum of oxide, you have to calcine your catalyst. These materials pick up all kinds of strange garbage in the air, which has to be burned off. Typically, that burning leaves you with a poorly dispersed catalyst. So, in advance, we pre-calcine all these materials to get clean baselines. Let's quickly look at simple CO can absorption of platinum TiO2 reduced to 250 degrees C. This very weak band high frequency here, we've uh, recently reported in the Journal of Physical Chemistry. We believe this is a combination mode having platinum carbon and CO stretching character. A very intense feature, the absorbing scale here goes to about 1.5, is of course CO on terminal, terminally bound CO on platinum. The split feature here reflects two different kinds of bridging binding sites. And here, this broad band, fairly weak, remember, we can multiply the scale by 15, at 1616 weight numbers, is an unusual CO band. We know this is due to CO because if instead of coming absorbing C12 CO, it absorbs C13 CO or C12 O18, this band does shift down in frequency. It does not shift according to the standard readily teller isotopic shift. But remember that isotopic shift assumes that there's only one unperturbed oscillator, that CO oscillator, and does not include any other types of force constants. Now, in fact, the interaction, such as we've shown here, is something that would require to do a much more complicated force constant calculation to get to the real shift. But as a friend of mine pointed out to me, the bandwidth of that band is almost 100 wave numbers. Its precise location is difficult to do with certainty, and it moves around a bit even on subsequent reductions and absorptions of CO. So I'm not sure if our deviation from reality is, in fact, something to worry too much about. By the way, we know this is not due to water. We can reduce these materials to D2 and absorb CO and still see the future in the same place. Spectra I won't show you, but it's been very difficult to show. When you reduce platinum TiO2 and hydrogen again, following the absorption of CO, the baseline absorbance goes to around two absorbance units and it gets very noisy. But I will summarize saying that that 1616 wave number band is the last band to disappear in hydrogen as we ramp in temperature to 250 degrees. I'll try to show you what we do see in alumina later. Just quickly, I want to show you that we're not restricted to platinum TiO2 here. CO can be absorption up 8% platinum alumina. Again, we pick up an unusual feature here around 1605. In this case, the feature uh, is even more difficult. It's frequently quite asymmetric. I've shown you the most symmetric band we've seen. It looks like there's at least two or three components to this band. What is it? I don't know, but we do know one thing. This band is not perturbed when we subsequently post-absorb D2O or pre-absorb D2O. So if it's a CO-related species and it's CO interacting with a very acidic Lewis site, it must be a very strong interaction because it blocks the reaction of a very strong Lewis base water with that site. Very briefly, I'd like to concentrate on the bottom half of this. One way we've looked at these species is by we need 
after an isothermal pulse surface reaction. We simply use our FTIR now rather than the grading instrument. We hold our sample in hydrogen at 500 K, record baseline, introduce a small hydrogen or deuterium CO pulse uh, into the cell, and then record our uh, FID signal and infrared as a function of time. The FID signal shows us the rapid onset of methanation in the pulse. First enters, enters the reactor, followed by a very slow decay. Let me tell you that there's very little be found by infrared spectroscopy in this early time region. We're simply dominated by all the terminal and bridging CO intensity. What I'd like to show you is what happens when we look later on in the final stages of hydrogenation. These spectra were recorded in about a, over a period of 30 seconds each, running from 17 minutes to 24 minutes. We're looking at ranges here of about 3 thousandths of absorbance unit. We can see the terminal CO band decay away slowly, and a whole series of now well-resolved, but uh, more uh, better resolved features in the low frequency region. Some of these, we, at this point, we, we, we suspect we like four main species, possibly on the aluminum near the type, near the black. But in fact, these are among the most stable surface structures. Now I've got two last quirky dots here. All I can say from this is we haven't found a good way of finding evidence from this data that we have an unusually reactive, unusual CO species. But I must acknowledge the fact in the last work we done that these measurements are made under very non-equilibrium conditions. These are not steady state catalytic uh, reaction measurements. And anyone who studied these catalysts knows that these catalysts do line in those periods of 30 minutes to an hour. So let's turn to steady state reaction studies. Here we now we turn back to platinum TiO2 because here we have the very, I think, the simplest and most interesting catalyst system of all. Again, in steady state, we find our terminal CO band at 265. Here's our combination band once more. But of interest to us are four other features. The 1630 band is something that comes and goes. Catalyst activity is constant. Some days we see it, some days we don't. I don't know what it's due to. It could be that other site we've seen during CO can absorption of room temperature but it is not a reproducible feature, and it certainly doesn't scale with catalyst activity. Now, initially, when I saw these bands, my technician was running the spectra, I politely said these are due to hydrocarbons on the support of some trans hydrocarbons. But I closed the inspection to be found, in fact, that those frequencies are 20 wave numbers away for the typical alkyl CH we expect. That deviation from reality is significant. All CH species seen on acting fish, working fish or trophic catalysts match just what you would find for a hexadecan. In fact, we found that there was a very good agreement of these frequencies for methoxy on titania surfaces, which had been studied. And our own studies show that methanol absorbed on titania gives bands at precisely these positions. Now, several features that I'm going to, several aspects of these bands that I'm going to discuss in a moment led us to say that we believe they're going to be intermediates. So we found that we could, in fact, switch from a CO hydrogen environment to a CO deuterium environment and monitor the decay of these species as we switch from one isotope to another and I hope to get some idea of reactive, uh, reactivity of these species. Let me briefly summarize what we've seen in a series of about two months worth of experiments. First of all, those methoxy species grow into a constant intensity of about 45 minutes as we approach steady state. After that, you can wait two days, and they, never, they simply never change in intensity. What's amusing is that if you look at your products by GC during that 4 45 minute period, they too are growing in to a constant productivity, which is relatively flat again over the next two days. Now, in steady state, in hydrogen CO at 230 degrees C, if we switch from hydrogen CO to deuterium CO, those the, all the epoxy species switch out with a half life of five minutes. <coughs> first guess, of course, was that the methoxy species we're seeing are simply methanol reabsorbing, methanol product reabsorbing on the titanium surface. But in fact, by varying space velocity, thereby residence time, and thereby concentration of methoxy, over a factor of 15, we found no variation in methoxy intensity. All of these results suggest that, in fact, the methoxy species are reactive intermediates on the way to products. How can species like that form? 
Alex has actually shown you some stuff that makes this easier to show. Perhaps it's at, a, it's at the metal oxide interface where this metal here is aluminum, titanium, or silica. That these hydroxyl groups activate CO by more of a nucleophilic attack with a transfer of by the transfer of formate species in the vicinity of platinum around that ring of platinum, which can subsequently, subsequently be hydrogenated to a gem dilate, hydrogenated further to methoxy, which we observe, hydrogenated further to methane or methanol, all regenerating the hydroxyl functionality. Now, this is all just speculative, but this is one of many, many uh, types of schemes that people talk for, discuss for methanol synthesis over classic copper zinc oxide catalysts that you need the copper and you need the zinc oxide functionality to do the methanol synthesis. The methane, in fact, might not be a primary product. We know that if we co-feed methanol with these systems, our methane yields go to the ceiling. So methanol itself can be turned into methane, complicating the kinetic analysis. This I won't discuss here. It's simply another hypothetical way of invoking chemistry at the oxide and the metal as vital chemistry in, as we proceed towards products. Let me simply summarize what we find with this system when we look at the alumina and silica supports. Silica, I'll dismiss with first. We only see CO on that surface. We see nothing else. Our signal noise is poor in that system. We haven't found anything else. Alumina is very reminiscent, I believe, of what Fritz Salmosi saw for rhodium on alumina. There is this steady and pervasive generation of formate on the alumina. After roughly an hour in CO hydrogen, there are 10 formates per surface flat. These, uh, the formate structure has been confirmed by deuterium and C13 labeling of the gases. But these materials seem to be much more inert species that we're used to seeing. As we shift, shift from hydrogen CO to deuterium CO, these materials sh switch back into uh, deuteroformate or C13 labeled formate only over a period of hours. In some cases, overnight is required, depending on how much formate has been built there. The formate grows over periods that we've seen so far in 14 hours. These results suggest that formate is an inert species of alumina. How do we reconcile this with methoxy on platinum? Well, in fact, if we're making methanol on platinum alumina, we know from separate studies that under these conditions, methanol will react far away from the platinum with the alumina to degenerate back to formate. That formate is an inert species. All it does is grow in intensity with time and mass prevent us from seeing anything else under those intense formate species. Finally, I'll conclude by saying simply that we do, in fact, if we look hard enough, we can find some unusual features in your 1600 weight numbers. And we very carefully reduce these clean platinum alumina titania catalysts. We can't see these on platinum silica. There could be a problem with silica, as you're well aware, probably, and when it's done this, silica itself has a very strong band at 1600 weight numbers, which makes it difficult to very easy to out of. Our isotope labeling shows that these bands are related to adsorbed CO. Structures for, that are responsible for those bands, I frankly don't uh, know how to explain this yet. We don't find any evidence, I can't show you any concrete evidence that shows that these are the most reactive species of hydrogen. Although I'm not sure we found the best experiment to test that. However, the most active material platinum on titanium is partially covered with these methoxy groups, which I think we've got a good case for showing are actually uh, intermediates to at least some of the reaction products. And I think we can incorporate this idea that. A lot of chemistry is happening in the metal oxide periphery, I hate to say interface because that's under the metal particle, but in fact, maybe the variable activity of these platinum oxide catalysts reflects variations in the ability of the oxide surface to stabilize intermediates of this kind. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's a big waste now for discussion. Uh, please identify yourself and step to one of the uh, microphones in the center aisle. Uh, Fritz? Sorry, it's the microscope. I'll show you what you do with the But, John, you know that these species, uh, which have a characteristic band of 1600 waves on that, have been detected in a number of cases, but no one was praised and probably clever enough to attribute it to the art of CO. But, you know that although the sexton 
like the danger that they feel for this business. Text on detective, such a type of band on clean platinum surface by his technique, and it attributed to the special form of format. But in the investigating use spectra, you did not find any other stretch of the format where you can exclude this possibility. So my problem is that if you prepare your sample under extremely dry condition, all the manipulation under dry condition, did you observe still this band? My problem. And the other that, that you mentioned that you did not find any exchange reaction and you used T2O, you did not find any shift. But if you use T2O at the beginning, you know, because what happened that this, if it is both and you make it strongly bonded, and if, but if you use T2O at the beginning, did you find any shift? It's my terrible yes, sir. Again, to the limits that I can define the band position, yeah, yeah. no shift. Yeah. Remember that band is 5200 wave numbers wide. It's very difficult to locate that piece. Okay. And the last next thing is that. Remind yourself, Fritz, I'm sorry, turn it up. That the form 8 vibrations in that region are hardly sensitive to H or T substitution because there are hydrogen and CO coupled modes. And my third question would be that. Do you have any evidence it locates on the metal, not on the support? I have no idea. No evidence to prove it one way or the other. Good with the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, John, uh, I believe it was the uh, platform on titanium. My notes are a little sketchy on that when you were going through it. But uh, you were talking about uh, how the methoxy species grew in as you were forming methane and, and, uh, and uh, methanol. Yes, basically if you looked at intensity versus time, they would find that band looking like this. If you looked at productivity versus time, they would track. Right. And it sounded like, uh, uh, if I interpret your statements right, that you're trying to, to decouple that from a reabsorption problem by changing space velocity. Yes. But, since most of your products are being produced within your pore structure, uh, I'm not sure that changing space velocity is going to necessarily help you there because that's just changing what's out in the bulk phase. And that you would probably get a lot of reabsorption within the pore structure. Well, let me say that uh, I think I'll hopefully address that issue. The titanium we use is to use a D25, which has, this is only diesel pores. Our pore structure there, we have 203 interaction pores. Uh, the aluminum we use is Alon C. It's a very similar structure, just smaller means of wars. Cabocil is our silica, again, a similar type structure. That's the best we could do. <laughs> Hi, Charles Bogdan, Lehigh University. If you go back into low energy electron mass spectroscopy and very low partial pressures of CO, your first doses of the CO, you see fourfold site. CO adsorbed onto the metal single crystal surfaces. Yeah. What precludes you from saying that these aren't just remnants of some of those fourfold site adsorbed COs, and that because of the high partial pressure of CO, the predominant species, as in single crystal, high partial pressures, is the top on or singly bonded CO? I thought about it myself. The problem is that on platinum, I've never seen a CO stretching frequency that low for any CO coverage on platinum by energy electron loss across the or by reflection to red. Maybe on palladium, but not on platinum. Okay, palladium definitely. Yes, You're right. Not on platinum. So what prevents me from doing that is I have no, no, uh, nothing to point to as possible. It's a possible analog in the case of platinum. Mm -hmm. Have you gotten below partial pressure to see? Yes, we, we followed the absorption and desorption of CO as a function of temperature, hydrogen, and helium. And you, the normal CO peak looks just like some like platinum one zero zero. Thank you. State. John, that was a very interesting talk. I just have one question that might address this uh, uh, interest is whether or not the species you see is associated with the metal surface or whether it's spread out across the entire surface of the titanium you support. Uh, the question I have, have you looked at these systems as a function of platinum loading or by varying the total platinum surface area per unit body? It's a good one. Yeah, it's a very good question. Because you may not be able to decide if it scales specific, specifically with the platinum surface, but if it's either at the interface or on the platinum, it should vary as a function of the total platinum surface area. Whereas if it's a secondary reaction where methanol is decomposing and you saturate the entire titanium surface, that's going to occur over independently over a long period of time. Okay, well we do know, first of all, we know we haven't done those studies 
typically everything you've done here is from three catalysts and everything's been repeated about five times for the absorption of these weak bands. Uh, what we do know, at least in the case of methoxy, at steady state, after one hour on platinum TiO2, there are approximately three methoxies per surface platinum. After six hours at steady state, there are the same roughly three methoxies per surface platinum. With formate, if we look at it as a function of time by again temperature program reduction of all the adsorbates, that simply grows in time to possibly eventually fill the flat the uh, aluminum surface. Uh, you know, it's related to the, the, methox the methoxy species. They actually correlate with time. That's species. possible, so yes, yes. Although uh, it's good idea. Yes. Northwestern University. We have been looking for other systems about it, and we found out that uh, 1600 wave numbers band on, on, on promoted loading catalyst. But I'm not sure, uh, we are not certain because the band is weak like yours. So I suggest the, next, the best way to tell is due to the water or, or the structure of support. The best way to do is use carbon footage and see that shape or not. That's exactly what we did, I think, was my third view graph. It's a very difficult thing to watch a band shift when the band is 100 wave numbers wide. Uh, we have to, to, again, eliminate the possibility of absorbed water. We frequently do our reductions in deuterium. We completely exchange all our hydroxides into deuteroxides. So there is no source for hydrogen to form a band. But we do the C13 labeling, we do O18 labeling. Frequently, it's not a big enough shift for a band that broad to be definitive. Do you have any other 